Right. The, the topic um, is about NATO's response to Baltic defense and its, its defensive changes in its defensive posture more generally. And on that first picture, you see uh, NATO ships exercising in the Baltic. You see helicopters operating during northern coast, exercise northern coast in 2018. You see the uh, battle group, the Polish battle group for enhanced forward presence. And you also see Petty Officer Robert Sinclair and his daughter Harper uh, at the homecoming day for uh, the Canadian frigate um, St. John's after a, after a deployment of many months in the Baltic, the North Sea, the North Atlantic, and the Mediterranean. And I would just emphasize that there is, the, there is a human face to NATO's response to Baltic and NATO defense. Since the topic that we were going to speak about, speak about was the response ever since the Wales summit. Well, let me start with the Wales summit. Uh, Julian has presented very well the issues uh, in terms of the Russian uh, naval uh, challenge that, as it has developed over the last few years. Politically, these changes are the result of the crisis that really started in 2007 with the cyber attacks in Estonia then the Georgia-Russia conflict in 2008, increasing naval and military harassment, and then, of course, the, the, the crisis in, in Ukraine, the uh, illegal annexation of Crimea, the, the, the quasi-proxy war and quasi-direct war against Ukraine in the Donbass. Um, what the NATO leaders met in Wales in 2014, and they took a number of key decisions that set us on a path. I think uh, my commander is quite right to say this was visionary. It wasn't fully implemented at the time. That would come. So the three core tasks of the strategic concept of NATO were affirmed. Collective defense, crisis management, cooperative security. But there was a new wind in the new breeze, new feeling in the air, a greater emphasis on Article 5. Uh, you described in terms of assurance, not so much deterrence, but assurance, the assurance of allies that NATO would be there to stand with them. A readiness action plan was launched to prepare NATO for the new situation, both in the East and the South. And there was a debate between those who were arguing for primacy in, secure, in terms of primary security concerns between East and South at the time. We reformed the NATO response force. It's not nearly as reformed as, as it is now, but we began to build a force that would be able to respond in, in weeks and not months with a spearhead force, the very high readiness joint task force. And then as now, the standing naval forces are the maritime uh, component of the very high readiness joint task force. There was also a commitment expressed to strengthen the standing naval forces in all warfare areas and to enhance NATO's cybersecurity activities. And so with, with 2014, with Wales, NATO began a, a process, a route, a route to betterment, and a significant development of its, of its capabilities. But it was slow going at first. The first year to two years was largely involved in doctrine work. But by 2016, the world had changed even more. And I would suggest that it had dawned on the leaders of the alliance that the world they knew, call it the post-Cold War era, had come to an end. Um, that era was based upon a world, an assumption of a world where there was a zero strategic threat, uh, there, was, there were no peer competitors, that the alliance forces exercised air and maritime supremacy, and that, so, and that, we, and that NATO was helping actively to build a world of cooperative southern partnerships around it that would, always, that would enhance alliance security. Most of those assumptions came apart. And there were some game changers. We've already mentioned Ukraine, but the other was Syria. Um, and uh, Admiral Johnston mentioned his October 2015 uh, remarks before the North Atlantic Council very early on in his command. Uh, I was in the room, and I've seen the knack before, and I have to tell you, there was a different feeling in the room. I walked out thinking that was the first conversation I'd heard about deterrence. And what was, the, what was the game changer from Wales? I think, personally, I think the game changer was Russia in Syria and Russia in the Mediterranean. And suddenly, people stood back and, and said, this isn't just about assurance anymore. That we actually have a real problem. And I think we began to see a direction of travel leading us to the Warsaw Summit. 
So what did we do? Well, once again, as others have described it, but we've, we, we focused on the maritime again. We launched Operation Sea Guardian uh, to deal with multiple challenges in the uh, maritime security challenges in the Mediterranean. They reiterated their, uh, res their support for resolute support in Afghanistan and in a significant push for NATO taken after many months of discussion, they named the cyber realm as an operational domain of warfare. That was a hard thing for NATO to do, but they, but they, 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 they finally went there. Enhanced forward presence, uh, I will leave that to General Wojciechowski to talk about, but I wanted to mention it because enhanced forward presence was, the, was really the major deliverable uh, of, the, of the Warsaw Summit. Now, certain allies, the U.S. in particular, had begun rotating uh, battalions through the Baltic states uh, as, as an immediate response to the initial Russian aggression in Ukraine. But in terms of NATO trying to solidify it, it was enhanced forward presence which did so. And, you, and, and there, of course, is the, from, actually from NMC Northeast's own, own material, there is kind of a general scope of who's doing what. But the Russians were not inactive. If, if, the, if the innovations of, the, of Warsaw uh, were intended to deter the Russians, it, deter, it may have deterred them from direct aggression. It did not deter them from competition. The competition increased. So we saw, as my commander mentioned, the first uh, frigates coming down from the Northern Fleet uh, to, in an effort to recapitalize the Black Sea Fleet, and we saw a constant stream of those assets. We saw the Kuznetsov Task Group deployment, in 2016, we have watched uh, as, ca as caliber missiles were launched from ships and submarines and little uh, PGGs uh, in the Caspian uh, at targets in Syria. There has been activity reported in the press on uh, uh, Russian uh, interest in underwater cabling in the Atlantic. And we observed and monitored their major exercises. Uh, in Zapad 2017, we were very interested in their activity in the Baltic. Uh, uh, I say underwhelming because there were a lot of small ships. It wasn't a big ship activity, but it was, a, in fact, some even said this looks like Iranian swarm tactics, lots of small ships. But when you take a look at the bigger picture of Zapad 17, it's interesting. You see activity in the North Atlantic, you see activity in the Mediterranean. Um, you could see it as Russia sending a signal that they are, they are postured to horizontally escalate if necessary. That's how I read it. And then Vostok 18 which, although it was not about the West, it was not about the Mediterranean, there was a substantial element of it with a major exercise in the Mediterranean um, and a major, uh, major Russian naval force with eight caliber missile fires in the Eastern Med, and at a time when it looked like uh, uh, the Syrian forces were going to hit Idlib and, and have a humanitarian catastrophe, and also possibly a use of chemical weapons that would have brought military reprisals from US, UK, and French forces. And, and, the, and, and the NATO standing naval group two was right there and playing actually a really important role. But bottom line, um, they're back uh, as, a hem as a blue water force, a hemispheric force, a small one with its best assets on the light side, but nonetheless, uh, some, now once again, the Russian Federation Navy is, is a strategic competitor and a force to be reckoned with. So how have we responded? Well, as Admiral Johnston mentioned, um, MARCOM has worked very hard, NATO has worked very hard to improve the standing naval force training cycle and its attractiveness. Uh, and that, and, and my, in my view, it's really high now. Um, we also separated the NATO response force forces, the standing naval groups, from the constabulary functions of maritime security. That was a major change that came out of the Warsaw Summit. So Operation Sea Guardian is separately resourced with separate frigates, separate um, MPAs. Uh, that, so it, 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 it does, it, it's not a draw upon or a distraction from the core missions of, of, of the standing naval groups. Since 2015, MARCOM also took up the role of, of not only of the commander of assets that were monitoring and tracking the Russian deployments, but in particular the Kuznetsov uh, uh, battle group, but also coordinating national activity. And this used to be the role of SACLANT. Uh, the, 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 an informal role was that they would coordinate allied activity under national command and control, and MARCOM very much picked up that 
in 2016 and beyond. Well, the exercises have been mentioned. And our, our presence, our standing naval force presence in the Baltic and Black Sea, our level of training and engagement has increased. Roughly from 2014, our engagement in the Baltic has about doubled and in the Black Sea has tripled. So you, you, we're, we're more present. And one of the challenges is to coordinate with allies better so that, that, so that our presence is, is well balanced uh, and, and we, we, have the right, we have the right total force posture uh, per design when we want it. And of course, there are the, there's the efforts to exercises. Now, I, I'd like to return to a, a, a comment that both Shimon made uh, and, 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 and Julian did. And this is, and, the, and my commander, that this is the broader, wider nature of Baltic defense. Uh, there is, of course, a local element, and we fo we're focusing on that, NATO's focusing on that with, with, with the expansion of its presence here, uh, its activities, its training. But there is a wider piece, and, that's the, and that is the entire Atlantic AOR, the entire NATO area of responsibility, because the threat of conflict, and certainly deterrence, uh, is a strategic and political problem. It's not just an operational problem, and it's certainly not only an operational problem in one part of the world. We are, uh, as was said, moving towards a better understanding of the concurrent nature of the threat. The NRF cannot be a force to be used in one place at one time with a gentleman's agreement that the Russians would never attack or threaten anywhere else while you're at war with them in one part of the world. Uh, we're, we're, we've got to think more broadly it should, in order to deter that situation from occurring. And one thing that Markham has talked about is the maritime chessboard, and that's a very crude picture, but drawing upon you know, the, the caliber capabilities, the missile capabilities, um, there is the danger, and you see some reflections of this in Russian doctrine, Russian thinking, that the the threats, particularly this, the caliber threats, the, the land attack cruise missile threats that, that, the, that the Russian Federation Navy could posture against NATO in a crisis uh, are broad and they're pan-regional. And indeed, they may well emphasize the Eastern Atlantic, even the Western Mediterranean, because the real target is the political will of capitals who, and a generation of leaders who have not experienced being under that kind of threat probably in their lifetimes. That's new, that's different political and strategic. In Markham, the, the commander has referred to it as the, new, the maritime chessboard, and there are several parts of it. One is what I've just mentioned. There is also the strategic challenge that we're getting out of Garashimov and a number of our best thinkers on Russia are describing this, the, the short war thinking. The idea that in fact, uh, in fact, this, we could almost be insulted because this is the thinking of, of Afghanistan, is the thing, I'm sorry, the thinking of Ukraine uh, and of Georgia, uh, and to some extent of Syria uh, in terms of the kinetic activity of the Russian forces in, when they first went in hard. Um, because it's, it, it, they're treating NATO all like it's another local war. We can act quickly and resolve it quickly to our advantage. Not a complete victory, not an existential fight, something local and limited and we'll, we'll control escalation and de-escalation, we NATO, well, sorry, we Russia, leading to a, a negotiated solution that favors us. That, now that is a challenge because NATO is, stru is structured to be very big, to think big, to think long-term massive assets, divisions and cores and battle fleets and carriers. But one of the challenges we may have is to, is to be able to deter an adversary who probably quite wrongly thinks they can take you by surprise and end it quickly. History is full of, of adversaries who thought that and were wrong. But, but, the, but the deterrent challenge is to keep them from trying, to convince them not to try. China is entering the picture. And that, that, that is a game changer with, with this really substantial Navy. And the sweep of non-state threats have not gone away. And instability has not gone away. We see the news from Libya this morning. So where are we now? At the Brussels summit, a number of, of innovations were, were put into train. Uh, the first was an adapted NATO command structure. And from the maritime point of view, the two real changes there was the elevation of MARCOM from a single service command to a theater maritime component with enduring roles from peacetime to high conflict um, and with a 360-degree responsibility across NATO's entire AOR, uh, 
with, 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 where, where their operational role would vary depending on the level of conflict. So as conflict would escalate, uh, tra local command and control would be transferred to assets of the NATO force structure. But in some enduring functions would always remain with, with MARCOM. And it's, 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 it is undeniably the central hub now for maritime uh, in, in NATO. And then the stand-up of Joint Force Command Norfolk, uh, which is the NATO hat of the U.S. Second Fleet. It's, they're just building it now, but this is, this is a welcome return of the U.S. Navy to an Atlantic focus, uh, in, institutionalized in NATO, in NATO structures, um, with a heavy emphasis on the, on the deterrence and the defense of the Atlantic, and in particular, the insurance of sea lines of communication uh, as part of the uh, reinforcement concept, the, the Allied reinforcement concept. There's also a new NATO military strategy being worked. And of course, this will reflect um, some of this new thinking we've described. This is all being worked right now. I can't say very much about it. But, but amongst the issues at the heart of the discussion really is readiness, rapid deployability, speed, and the, and the concurrency of the challenge across the entire AOR. Then, as mentioned, the NATO Readiness Initiative, um, the 430s. Uh, for, for maritime, that's 30 ships, 30 assets uh, available within 30 days. And as someone once said to me, uh, yeah, 30, but not, only, but not only for 30 days. And so it's not just what you can put at sea in 30 days, it's how long can they, be, how long can they stay there? How good are they? How ready are they? It's an investment effort. It's primarily an investment effort. It's a desire to get allies to uh, raise the standard of readiness of, of, of their forces, of, of a core of forces that, that represents a really a quite substantial force package. If you think about the numbers, there are, if, if fully manned, there are 12 frigates destroyers in the two SMGs at full manning. And that's the very high readiness joint task force for maritime. If you add to that the Intermediate Follow-on Forces Group for Maritime, that's another, I don't know, another seven assets perhaps? Okay, so you're looking at about 20 in the here's the NATO punch. We're talking about adding another 30 within 30 days. So it's a, it's a, it's a guaranteed availability. It's quite a substantial uptick in NATO's readiness. But still, we have that short war problem, and we have to think about how even this initiative will address you know, the problem of an adversary that might want to move in days, in days, not weeks. The reinforced maritime posture, which I'll come, in, come to in a moment, uh, you know, is something Markham is, is significantly involved with. And then the alliance reinforcement concept, which is the more joint and, and strategic level uh, uh, initiative to look at reinforcement, particularly across the Atlantic and across the continent of Europe in terms of land, land uh, harmonization of land standards, transport standards, logistics, and the new uh, JSEC in Germany will be in, at Ulm will be playing an important role there. So to conclude, on the maritime posture, um, what, are we trying, what, is, what is NATO trying to do when it says it's reinforcing its maritime posture? Well, first, um, one thing that has changed, in a sense, this is another example, like piracy, where the facts on the ground have changed. Doctrine, doctrine is trying to catch up. But NATO, NATO and national forces at sea have a job when they're not doing exercises uh, and, and they're not doing port visits. It's not white noise. It was for a while. It's not white noise anymore. Now they have a, they have a deterrent posture to maintain. They have monitoring and tracking to do. And so we're thinking hard about how we incorporate that, institutionalize that new reality into it. And that's part of the maritime posture discussion. Um, we're trying to build the standing naval forces as a much more flexible instrument. Uh, Admiral Johnston just submitted a few weeks ago Marcom's proposals to shape for that. We're expanding OSG. We're trying to strengthen the Operation Sea Guardian to, it, to a wider set of its tasks and, and improve information sharing for that. We are looking at how we can draw on forces beyond the standing naval forces as necessary to meet uh, particularly uh, uh, Russian deployments and emergent challenges. We continue to move forward in getting better situational awareness of the combined NATO allied fleet to understand and so that Admiral Johnston can advise SACUR on options in, in the event of a crisis with a full understanding of where the allied fleet stands in terms of its availability, its presence, and its readiness. And as was mentioned, a continuing focus 
on improving core tactical skills and challenges. So that's the heart of it. I, did, I didn't mention one thing which I should have mentioned. For the standing naval forces, in addition to the force package, and, 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 and in essence, the force package, the idea of the force package is to have a really core, high-end capable you know, nucleus that can be added to. But equally as important is greater flexibility in what MARCOM and allies can do with their ships. So we, you know, we, to, be, to, be, uh, to have flexibility in what we call the schedule of operations is an important goal. Uh, in, in, giving us, in, giving, in giving us that flexibility. With that, I think I shall conclude. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions later. Thank you very much.